today, we're going to talk about basis, dimension, and the fundamental theorem of linear algebra, part one. In the whole series, this is the lecture that I find the most challenging. While the end result is relatively straightforward, I would like to invite you to listen to it twice. The first time around, just try and take it in, but don't get hung up on the details. The second time around, however, I want you to listen to it with paper and pen in hand, pause the lecture every time I make a remark or every time I point to something in a matrix, and make sure you understand it. Because it is not just the how and the what that you're after, it is the why, why things work the way they do. So with that, let's get started. First idea is what we'll call the basis for a vector space. And I will begin with a motivating example where I start with a matrix A and I'm going to compute a row echelon form. And just to make it simple, I have computed the reduced row echelon form of this matrix. So what you see is first and second column has a pivot, the third one doesn't, the fourth one has a pivot again, and the remaining two vectors do not. The right-hand side of a system AX equals B is going to be a linear combination of these columns. And whatever relationship that we see at any one level when we do Gaussian elimination has to hold at every one level. All we are really doing is taking AX equals zero, which in column view is a linear combination of the columns of A, and we're multiplying it by the elementary operation matrices. And so at each level in such a decomposition, we're going to see a simplified system with more and more zeros in it, but the same X holds at each level. So when we think now about linearly independent columns, we see the following. First of all, the row echelon form of our solution here that we see is that the columns of A are linearly dependent. There are three variables. There are columns without pivots in them. The other thing we see is that uh, we have a row of zeros. So the system AX equals B is not onto R4. There are right-hand side vectors in R4 that we will not be able to reach. The system can be inconsistent. And so the linear combination of the columns of A forms a hyperplane inside of R4, but it is not all of R4. So we have a system of equations and we'll rewrite that in column view. So here it is. And now remember that each one of these columns doesn't have a pivot. We have three variables. When we solve the system, when we go over here, we say, well, x3 is a free variable and set it equal to alpha. x5 and x6 are free variables. We set them equal to beta and gamma. So any solution that we have for our system is going to involve this homogeneous solution. It's going to involve alpha, beta, and gamma. If we set alpha, beta, and gamma equal to zero, then that homogeneous solution disappears. But what is alpha equals zero, beta equals zero, gamma equals zero? Alpha is x3, beta is x5, and gamma is x6. When I set alpha equal to zero, I set x3 equal to zero, but that's equivalent of throwing out the column that x3 multiplies, similarly for x5 and x6. So the system above has an infinite number of solutions if I leave the free variables in, but if I set those three variables equal to zero, what I'm doing is I'm removing the columns and I still have the exact same right-hand sides that I can solve for. The span of the columns hasn't changed, but now I have a unique solution if I do that. So the system therefore reduces to the following. The first column had a pivot in it, so yes, I'll keep it. The second column had a pivot in it, I have to keep it x3 we set equal to 0, x4 we have to keep, and x5, x6 we set equal to 0. We still have solutions for every b that we had before, but now that solution is unique. So in summary, if I do this, if I take a set of vectors and compute their span, right? so I have the span of the columns of A over here, and I saw that V3, V5, and V6 were linearly dependent on the other vectors. When I remove them, 
I'm still left with a span for the exact same vector space as before. And the difference is that now the vectors in that definition of that span are linearly independent and that any vector in that span that I try and write as a linear combination of these vectors is unique. This leads us to the definition of a basis. Here's the concept. Suppose I have a vector space V that has some vectors in it, V1, V2, Vn, and let's assume the following, that these vectors span all of V. So just looking at the span, I get all of V, but that will have thrown away all the vectors we don't need, so the vectors that form that span are linearly independent. When I have that case, so when I'm down here in my example, that's when I call these vectors a basis for that space. And note, the definition here is very, very carefully written in terms of vectors in an arbitrary vector space. So this idea of ours of looking at the columns of A actually generalizes to arbitrary vector spaces. Now, the next thing we want to look at is how did we construct those basis vectors? After all, we say the non-pivot columns are getting thrown out and the remaining columns we keep, but that idea works for vectors in Rn, and we want to do this for general vectors. So let's look again at how we did this, and in fact, there's two ways of going about this. Let me go back to the original set and show you what's going on. So look here. Suppose I start with all of my vectors. I start with all of my vectors, I check whether or not they're linearly dependent, yes or no. And in this case, since there are vectors that do not have pivots in them, they're linearly dependent. Look at this vector over here. You will see that it has entries minus one, one, and minus one. And in terms of the vectors that have the pivots in them, to get that minus one, I have to take minus one times this vector. To get this one, I have to add one times this vector to it. And to get that minus one, I have to subtract this vector. So minus this vector plus this vector minus this vector gives me the last vector. And that has to hold at every level. So minus this vector plus this vector minus that vector indeed gives me the last vector. So I can throw out this vector and now I have a reduced set. I only have five vectors left. And again, I check, are they linearly independent, yes or no? And I find that this vector over here, for example, I can write in terms of the pivot vectors. Actually, I don't necessarily have to look at this one. Any one that I can write in terms of the pivot vectors will do, for example, this one over here. If I see that this one, I can write in terms of actually these two vectors here, these two columns, then I can throw it away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep throwing vectors away that I can write in terms of vectors that I still have in the set until I'm down to just the pivot vectors. Once I only have the pivot vectors, if I try and throw one of the pivot vectors away, look what happens. See this one here? The other pivot vectors have zeros in this position. So if I throw this vector away as well, then I can't reach any one vector that has a non-zero entry in this row. So pivot vectors, the moment I throw a pivot vector away, I change the span. Unless I throw pivot vectors away, the span stays the same. So the idea then, if I look at what we are doing, is we start with all of the vectors and we remove one vector at a time, as long as the vector we remove is a non-pivot vector. And in the end, we're left with linearly independent vectors. We can also go the other way. We can try and build up one vector at a time. I start with no vectors at all, and then I add the first vector, or I try to add the first vector. It's non-zero, so it's linearly independent, so I keep it. Then I go to the second vector. I try and add it to the first. So now I have got these two vectors, and I check whether or not they're linearly independent. I find that they are, and so I keep this vector as well. Now I try and add a third vector. Again, I check whether or not they're linearly independent, and I find that this third vector is actually linearly dependent on the previous two. So I don't need it, 
I already have it with the previous two, so I skip it. I add the next vector. Now I've got first, second, and fourth. I check whether or not they're linearly independent. And since I see that they are, I'm going to keep this vector as well. Uh, the next two vectors, when I try and add them, I find that they're linearly dependent, both of these. And so I'll keep both of these. And again, I'll end up with the exact same vectors that I just built up the other way. If I now go back and look at this in terms of arbitrary vectors, that idea actually generalizes. So given a set of vectors, we check whether or not they're linearly dependent. And if they are, we find one of the vectors in that set that we can write as a linear combination of the others, and we remove it. Then we go back and we check our vectors again. If they're still linearly dependent, we find another vector to remove. And we keep going until the vectors are linearly independent. That's starting from all the vectors and going down. We can also go up. So we start with no vectors whatsoever. We take a vector, we add it to our set, or we try to add it to our set. We check linear independence, they're independent, so we keep it. Otherwise, we would omit it. Then we add the next vector, we again check linear dependence. If they're independent, we keep it. Otherwise, no, we omit it. And we keep building up until we have considered all of the vectors. So what that leads us to is the following idea. If I look at the selection of pivots in there, so look at this vector, this vector, and this vector. What this says is that the first vector minus the second vector minus the third vector is equal to zero. So I can solve for any one of these vectors in terms of the other. In particular, I could solve for this vector in terms of the first and the third. So I could say that this vector is linearly dependent on the first and the third vector and keep the third one instead, and it would have a pivot right here, and everything would proceed as before. So when I think about that, I see that, first of all, bases aren't unique. Right? I just changed my bases by replacing vector 2 with vector 3. But the other thing to notice is that all we've done is we've substituted one basis vector for another. So the overall number of vectors in that basis stayed the same. Turns out that's a very easily proved theorem, and it applies to arbitrary vector spaces. So the theorem is, Given two bases for a vector space, they have the same number of elements. That says that the number of elements is a constant for a vector space, is therefore an important idea. And so we give it a name. The dimension of a vector space is the number of vectors in a basis for that vector space. Let's look at R3, uh, how R3 works. Well, the very first vector space I can come to is just the origin, the smallest vector space that we can have inside of a vector space. And in terms of its dimension, well, it has no basis. There's no linear independent vector to be found in this space. And therefore, the dimension of that space is zero. If I add a non-zero vector next, so I now look at the span of this one vector, that's a line. The line has dimension one. There's a single vector in our basis. If I add a second vector that's linearly independent from the first, now what I have is a plane. So it has dimension of the plane equal to two. Next, if I add yet another vector that is linearly independent of the previous two, this time I have three vectors and they form a basis for, well, a three space. Could that be all of R3? It will turn out that yes, it will be all of R3. After all, if I start with a plane with the first two vectors, and then I can go anywhere in that plane. And if I then add a third vector that points out of that plane, I can go anywhere in three space. So we are going to have to argue a little bit to show that that is true, but yes, this will indeed be R3. Let's next look more generally at the dimension of Rn. So if I look at Rn, the thing that I notice is that I can take any one vector in Rn, v1, v2, v3 through vn, 
and decompose it into V1 times what amounts to the first column of I plus V2 times the second column of I, V3 third column of I, all the way to the end. So V1 plus V2 and V3 and Vn. I'm going to reconstruct the whole vector that. These vectors are obviously linearly independent. Each one of them has a pivot. They span all of Rn, and therefore they form a basis for Rn. And so we see that not only is Rn a vector space, but it's a vector space of dimension n. There are n vectors. This particular basis, the columns of an identity matrix, is therefore important. It gets a special name. It's called the standard basis of Rn. Rn, therefore, is a vector space of dimension n. Since Rn contains subspaces, let's look at the subspace example, but let's limit it to R3 to make it simple. So here, look at the xy plane. The xy plane has a coordinate system that we typically call Ij, consisting of the first two vectors in the standard basis for R3. So any one point in the plane can be written as a linear combination of these coordinate systems, and so this plane inside of R3 has dimension 2. There are three entries, but there's only two vectors needed to define any one vector in the xy plane. More generally, two vectors in some vector space, give me uh, basis vectors, give me a coordinate system for any one point in that subspace. So here, I have a vector v1, and a vector v2, they're linearly independent, they point in different directions. They form a coordinate system. Any one vector in that plane, in this two-dimensional subspace, can be written as a linear combination of v1, v2, as alpha v1 plus beta v2. And if you and I agree that we use v1 and v2, and that v1 is the first of these and v2 is the second of these, then instead of alpha v1 plus beta v2, I can simply refer to alpha and beta, the multipliers that I need on those vectors that we decided on. This defines a vector with just two entries, the, those multipliers, alpha and beta. We give this vector a name, we call it the coordinate vector. And therefore, a basis I can think of as a system of coordinates for my subspace, and the multipliers form the coordinate vector that specifies any one point in the subspace and specifies it uniquely. So here is how it's written out for the 2x2 two two system. Any one point in the xy plane is alpha, beta, and coordinate 0, and therefore can be written as a linear combination of alpha times the first vector plus beta times the second vector. So alpha, beta is the coordinate vector. It's a vector in R2, dimension 2. And the other thing that we do is to go from here to the coordinate vector, we don't just drop zeros. We don't just arbitrarily drop an entry in our vectors. We define a mapping. We define a map that says, well, the coefficients alpha and beta are what we have. And by the way, that idea works no matter what basis vectors I have. So in here, this doesn't look like ij. These are vectors that form an angle with respect to each other that's not necessarily 90 degrees, if I think in terms of R3. The other point about this mapping is that it is invertible. If I say that here my coordinate vector is alpha beta, and we know what v1 was, we know what v2 were, then we know what the original vector was. It's alpha v1 plus beta v2. Similarly, if I want to think in terms of vectors i and j, then the way to go from alpha beta to a vector alpha i plus beta j is to define another function, is to define a mapping from the coordinate vector to this representation alpha i plus beta j. So if I see a vector 1, 0 in an application, unless somebody tells me otherwise, this vector, I'll represent it as a vector in R2, but it might equally well stand for some basis vector that I would have to specify. So for example, for functions, it might be the first basis vector of a basis sine x cosine x. 
So all of these ideas really generalize to arbitrary vector spaces and in particular to the vector space of functions. But for this course, we're not going to go there. If you're interested, I'm making this notebook available so you can read what's in here. But all of this leads to a couple of useful theorems that we should keep in mind. The first one is suppose I have a vector space V and a subspace of that vector space called U. The dimension of U is less than or equal to the dimension of V. The dimension of a plane inside of R3 is 2. The dimension of R3 is 3. Another very useful theorem is the following, that if I happen to know the dimension of my vector space, I happen to know that I have a vector space V, could be a subspace, and it has dimension N. And I start with a set of vectors v1 through vn. So I have the right number of vectors. Then to show that those vectors actually do form a basis for v, well, in general, I'd have to show that they span v and that they are linearly independent, but I know I have the right number of vectors. Then what happens is I only need to check one of these. If I know that these vectors, if I check that these vectors are linearly independent, then the theorem says they also must span and therefore there must be a basis. Also, the other way around, I have n vectors, the dimension is n, and I know that the vectors span the system and therefore there must be a basis. So when I gave you that example before that I had three vectors, one, two, and three, they were inside of R3. And so we formed the span of these vectors. That's the subspace in R3. But R3 has dimension 3. I have three vectors inside of R3. Therefore, they form a basis for R3. And the span, therefore, is all of R3. So when I said earlier that, well, we'll have to argue a little bit more to say that we got all of R3 when we added the third vector, this is why. This is how we see it. The big application of all of this is we'll define some important subspaces associated with a matrix. So let's start with the definitions. Let's start with a matrix of size M by N. It turns out that from that matrix, there's four spans that we can construct very easily. The first one is the one we've been discussing all along is the span of the columns of A. In matrix form, that's just all of the vectors W, so that W is equal to AX for any X that I care to plug in there. It, this span of the columns is called the column space of A. It's written with a, a script C applied to A. The range of the function Y equals AX, therefore, is another name for the column space, or the column space is another name for the range. A second set that I can define is called the row space. It's simply the span of all of the rows of A. And if I think in terms of rows of A, the rows of A are the columns of another matrix, the transpose of A. So I can think of the row space of A as the linear combination of the columns of A transpose. The row space of A is the column space of A transpose, the column space of A transpose, similarly is the row space of A. Another space that we know is the homogeneous solutions. If you remember, the set of homogeneous solutions is all solutions that look like alpha times a vector plus beta times a vector plus 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 for all possible coefficients alpha, beta, gamma when we write down the homogeneous solutions. Well, that's a span and therefore the set of homogeneous solutions, all the vectors in R such that AX is equal to zero, they form a subspace, and that subspace we call the null space of A. It turns out that the null space of A transpose is distinct, so I'll write it down as well. The null space of A transpose, therefore, is the homogeneous solutions of A transpose times a vector equal to zero. All the vectors that A transpose equals zero is a solution for. Now, if I try and figure out where these systems are, let's look at the right-hand side first. Our matrix of size n by n is, in this example, is size 2 by 4, so it looks like this. A matrix of two rows with four columns, 
times a vector x, for that multiplication to exist, that vector x must have four entries in it, and the result is going to be a vector with two entries. So the rows have four entries, the same number of entries as the x vector. So if I think in terms of y is equal to ax, the x's are the domain of that function, the y's are in the codomain of that function. So the x's are in Rn, and the y's are in Rm. And what we just said is that the rows have the same number of entries as an x vector. So the n of the rows lives in the domain. It's a hyperplane in the domain, and hyperplanes viewed edge on look like a line. So stylistically, this line hides a hyperplane of whatever dimension, it's the row space of A. The columns have two entries each, the same as the y vector. The y vector is in the codomain, in the Rm. So the column space of A, the linear combination of the columns, lives in the codomain over here. And again, it's a hyperplane in the codomain through the origin of whatever dimension. The null space of A, sometimes called the right null space because the x's are on the right of the matrix A, all of the homogeneous solutions of AX equals zero. Well, that's x's. So the x's live in the domain. So the null space is in the domain of the function y equals AX. And similarly, you can argue that the null space of A transpose is in the codomain. And if you check why that might be called the left null space, well, we're looking at all of the solutions of A transpose Y equals zero. But if you take a transpose of that, that's a vector times A equals zero. It's all the vectors so that if I multiply my A from the left, I get zero and therefore left null space. So this schematic we're going to build on. Please review this if you haven't quite followed we want to make sure that you understand which of these spaces is where. Two of them are in Rn, two of them are in Rm. Now, it turns out that bases for these spaces are very easily obtained from Gaussian elimination. What I'm going to do is I'm going to argue that Gaussian elimination, as uh, we've already seen, amounts to taking a matrix A and applying a matrix to the left of it applying EA to get a row echelon form of A. So let's think about the column space again. The column space is all of the vectors in our first example over here. If we go back to it, those were the first column, second column, and fourth column in that vector. So the pivot columns in A form a basis for a column space of A. How many did we find? No the number of pivots. So the dimension of this subspace of the com space of A is the number of pivots that we get in Gaussian elimination. The number of pivots remains unchanged. So if you had a question way back when of whether or not rearranging the variables in the system of equations, what that might do, well, it gives us the same set of solutions, but it might have slightly different basis vectors it might pick another one of those vectors and use its pivot instead. So let's now look at the row space of A. The row space of A, even though the end result is going to be very simple, we'll need to make a few arguments. So we'll have to discuss this a little bit. So start with Gaussian elimination and the fact that we multiplied A by some matrix E, carefully chosen to put the zeros where we want them, to get a row echelon form. And that matrix E was carefully chosen so that it is invertible. So we can flip it over to the other side. We see that A is some matrix times the row echelon form. And what this says is here, we have the row echelon form and we have the inverse of that matrix. Here it is. When I take the inverse of that matrix and multiply it into the row echelon form, the result is my matrix A. What that says is the following. Look at that zero row, first of all. Do I need that zero row when I do the multiplication of this matrix times this one? That zero row is always going to get hit by these numbers. That zero row doesn't really enter. 
I could erase that zero row and that last row and still recover all of A. So what this says is the first row of A over here, I get from the first row of the row echelon form. One times the first row plus zero times the second row plus zero times the third row recovers the first row of A. Here, for the second row of A, I see minus two times the first row plus the second row in the row echelon form recovers the second row of A when I multiply it out. To recover the third row of A, it's minus one times the first row plus one times the third row. That adds up to the third row of A and similarly for the fourth row. Each of the rows of A is a linear combination of the rows in the row echelon form. What all of that lets us conclude, therefore, is that any linear combination of the rows of A, no, each row of A is written as a linear combination of rows in the row echelon form. Therefore, any linear combination of the rows of A can be written as a linear combination of the pivot rows in R. I don't need to use that vector of zeros. I just need to use the rows that have pivots in them, the non-zero rows. We can also try and figure out, well, which rows of A did I actually use? I have four rows. There's three of them that will enter, but normally I don't know which three. I'd have to try and go back. We can actually read it out of here as well, since when I delete that last row in the row echelon form of the matrix, that forces me to delete the last column of the E matrix in that product. What that says, therefore, is that when I delete that last row, I can recover the first row, the second row, and the third row of A with an invertible matrix. And therefore, the pivot rows are generated from the first three rows and vice versa. The first three rows generate the pivot rows in the row echelon form. One more observation to make here is the following. Look at the pivot rows, the ones that we actually need to recover the rows of A. If I look at the columns that the pivots are in, they normally have non-zero entries above the pivot if I only go to any one row echelon form. Here I have zeros because I went to the reduced row echelon form. But what I have is a triangular matrix inside of this set of three row vectors. These row vectors, therefore, are linearly independent. So I have three vectors here, the three rows that have non-zero entries in the row echelon form that regenerate all of the vectors in the rows of A and therefore form a basis for the row space of A. So any linear combination of the rows of A is expressed as a linear combination of the pivot rows. The pivot rows are linearly independent by construction. They therefore form a basis for the row space of A. And how many are there? The number of pivots. So we conclude that the pivot rows of a row echelon form of A form a basis for the row space. And should we want to pick from the rows of A instead, we would have to make an argument in terms of which rows of A are linearly independent. So we could look for the pivot columns in a transpose if we wanted to. But if all we're interested in is a basis, we'll pick from the row echelon form and be done with that. So for the current example that we have, the row space for the matrix A has a basis that we pick from U. The first row in here is 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, minus 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, minus 1 and the remaining vectors. They form a basis. What we now know is that the number of pivots is the dimension for the column space of A, and the number of pivots is the dimension of the row space of A. And since column space of A and row space of A transpose are the same, and row space of A and column space of A transpose are the same, we know that A and A transpose 
had the same number of pivots. That gives us the fault. The number of pivots then is important. It's called the rank of A. It's simply the number of pivots we see when we do Gaussian elimination. And the result that we just arrived at, we'll call the theorem. The dimension of the column space of A is the number of pivots. The dimension of the row space of A is the number of pivots, therefore the rank. And the dimension of the column space is equal to the dimension of the row space. And since this works for any matrix A, in particular, it works for one that happens to be the transpose of that matrix. So the dimension of the column space of A transpose is equal to the dimension of the row space of A transpose is also the rank of A. So A and A transpose have the same rank. So well, let's go to the null space. The null space of A, the homogeneous solution is for our model problem is what I've written here. But what I've outlined in red are the three variables. If you look at the structure of the homogeneous solution, you get this first vector by setting alpha equals one, beta equals zero, gamma equals zero. But that's alpha is X3. So you get the first vector here by setting X3 equal to one, X5 beta equal to zero, and X6 equal to zero. You're going to see one zero zero for that first three variable. To get the second vector, it's alpha equals zero gets rid of this, gamma equals zero gets rid of that one, and beta equal to one. So for the second three variable, I have alpha equal to zero, beta equal to one, gamma equal to zero. Similarly for the third vector, for alpha zero, beta zero, gamma one. If you look, what I have in here is I. These vectors are linearly independent by construction. So the vectors that I see in the homogeneous solution, they form a basis for the null space of A. And therefore, all I have to do is I compute the homogeneous solution and I pick the vectors in my set and then that is the basis for the null space of A. How many are there? Well, the number of free variables. What is the number of free variables in terms of the number of columns? N minus the number of pivots. But the number of pivots we call the rank, so it's n minus the rank of a. So we have a theorem. The dimension of the column space, that was the rank, plus the dimension of the null space, that's n minus the rank, adds up to n. Well, if you think about it, all that really says is that the number of the basic variables, that's the number of pivots, plus the number of the free variables, add up to the number of columns. So the basis for the null space of A transpose, A transpose is just another matrix. It happens to be size N by M rather than M by N, but this theorem applies equally well for a matrix that happens to be A transpose. And therefore what we see is that the dimension of the row space of A, which is the dimension of the column space of A transpose, plus the dimension of the null space of A transpose, that that adds up to M as well. Well, that was a lot of theory. And if you want to see how to get the basis, it turns out it's very easy to read, but it's outside of scope. So I'll let you look at the notebook if you're interested, but let's summarize the whole thing. What we've done is we have a matrix of size M by N. We've done Gaussian elimination and found the number of pivots, R, that is the rank of the matrix. And Gaussian elimination really says that I that matrix A, I pre-multiply it by a matrix E, and I get a row echelon form R. That matrix E is invertible, and here is the picture that goes with this. We start with y equals ax, and x, the domain of x is Rn, the codomain of x is Rm, where m is the number of rows, and n is the number of columns in our matrix. The row space of A and the null space of A are in the domain. The dimensions of those spaces are for the row space of A, it's the number of pivots, R. For the null space of A, it's the number of three variables, n minus R. So the dimensions add up to n.
The same picture applied to the matrix A transpose. Well, the row space of A transpose is the column space of A. So here's that picture for A transpose. The column space of A and the null space of A transpose, they are in Rm, the number of rows in our matrix. The dimension of the column space of A is the number of pivots. And the dimension of the null space of A transpose is m minus the number of pivots. Those two numbers, the dimension of the column space of A and the dimension of the null space of A transpose, they add up to m. Now, when we want to find the basis, let's look over on this side. The row space and the null space, they live in our n. The way we get the basis vectors for the row space of A, we pick the pivot rows in R in the row echelon form of the matrix. And the number of rows with pivots is just the rank of A. For the null space of A, we have to solve AX equals zero. So we get the homogeneous solution and we probably solve it from Rx equals zero instead, since we already have computed R. And the dimension for that space is the number of free variables, the number of columns minus the number of pivots. The same theorem applies for the matrix A transpose. So if we want the column space of A, there we're going to pick the pivot columns of A, however many pivots we have, that's how many there are. And I skipped this, but if you're interested, it's in this notebook. There's a very easy argument to make that when we look at the matrix E, the basis for the null space of A transpose is simply the non-pivot rows in E. One more thing, that sketch that I made of the fundamental theorem, it suggests that the spaces are distinct, that the row space and the null space are different, that the column space and the null space of A transpose are different. And most of the time that's actually true. It depends on the system of scalars. And for R, for example, it definitely is true. Where it doesn't hold is some out of the ordinary number systems like modulo two arithmetic. And modulo two arithmetic is important in digital transmission applications. So I want to warn you that that picture where it looks like those spaces are distinct holds most of the time. But if you are into communications, you actually will have to remember that no, that picture might be a little bit misleading in those special cases. That part of the theorem is actually in part two, and we'll discuss that later. So let's look at some examples just to show you how the computations go. So for our first example, let us look at a matrix of size one by three. Here, A is equal to a single row, one, two, and five. So A as a linear transformation, Y equals AX goes from R3 to R1. Notice that A is already in row echelon form. So we can take the row echelon form to be the same as A. This matrix has exactly one pivot, so the rank of A is one. To figure out the column space, what I advocate is that you always write down both the definition of the space, so a span of vectors, the basis of the space, the coordinate system for that span of vectors, and the dimension, all three concepts. I know it's a little bit hard to wrap your mind around in the beginning, but if you write all three of them down, you are not going to go wrong. So let's look at our matrix again. We know we have to pick the pivot columns from A. There's only a single entry in a column. So the column space of A is the span of the single pivot column, just a vector with a single entry one. And what it is, is a line in R1. The basis for the column space that we just found, well, you throw away that word span, you're left with just the collection of vectors, the coordinate system for that line. And the dimension is the number of vectors that we found, it's equal to one. For the row space of A, we have to go to a row echelon form, in this case, A again, and we have to pick the pivot rows of that row echelon form. No, well, it's one to five. So the row space of A is the span of one to five. And when you think about that geometrically, that's a line in R3. The basis for the row space of A, the coordinate system that we need for that line, is we throw away the word span, 
we have this single vector on that line, it forms a coordinate system for that line, it forms a basis for that line, and the dimension for the row space of A is equal to 1. For the null space of A, we have to solve AX equals 0. The solution is easy to write down, so rather than go through it, here it is. The solution is alpha times minus 2, 1, 0, plus beta times minus 5, 0, 1. So those two vectors form a basis for the null space. The null space is the span of these two vectors. That's a plane in R3. The basis is, the coordinate system is these two vectors, and the dimension of that null space is 2. If you look at what's left for the null space of A transpose, you'll find that the dimension is equal to 0. The null space of A transpose is just the 0 vector, just the origin. doesn't have a basis. Dimension is equal to 0. Summarizing all of that, this is what we see. The row space of A was a single line, and we had a basis vector, a coordinate vector for that single line, and so any vector in the row space is alpha times this basis vector. The null space of A, 3 minus 1 is equal to 2, the null space of A sits in a plane. There are two vectors, those two that we had found for the null space, that form a coordinate system for this plane, and this then is the picture that we get for the row space and the null space. For the column space of A, we found a line with a single basis vector. And since we have a single row, Y is just in R1. There's no space left over for a dimension. So the dimension of null space of A transpose is 1 minus 1 is 0. And that completes the picture. We are going from 3 space to 1 space. In terms of where we pick the solutions from, row space and null space were in R3. The row space, we picked the pivot rows of R, the single vector, 1 to 5. For the null space of A, we had to find the solution of AX equals 0 or RX equals 0. We found two vectors. For the column space of A, we picked the pivot columns in A, and therefore there was exactly one such. And for A transpose, there was no room left. The null space of A transpose is just the origin. For my next example, let's look at the matrix of size 3 by 3. Here's my matrix. 1, 2, 5, 2, 4, 8, 1, 2, 3. A row echelon form for this matrix. So we have two pivots in it and a row of zeros. My column vectors are linearly dependent. And I wrote down the matrix E that reduces A to row echelon form. Here it is. We see two pivots, so the rank is equal to 2. And since A is size 3 by 3, the transformation Y equals AX starts from X in R3 and goes to R3. The column space. The column space, we have to look for the pivot columns in A. So first pivot column third pivot column, first column of A, third column of A. These two columns form a basis for a column space of A. So the column space is the span of these two vectors. That's a plane in R3. A basis, a coordinate system, are those two vectors. So a coordinate system of two vectors inside this plane. And the dimension of this column space, therefore, is the rank is equal to 2. The row space of A. The row space of A, I have to pick the pivot rows of A row echelon form matrix. So 1, 2, 5, and 0, 0, minus 2. Here they are, 1, 2, 5, 0, 0, minus 2. They again, they form another plane in R3. A basis for that row space are those two columns. So that's a set of two coordinate vectors for that plane. And the dimension of the row space of A is equal to 1. The homogeneous solution. If I look at the solution of AX equals 0, again, it's trivial to write down. It's just minus 2, 1, 0 times alpha. The homogeneous solution, therefore, is the span of minus 2, 1, 0. That's a line inside of R3. And so the null space is given by the span, that line in R3. The basis for the null space is that vector, the coordinate vector for that line, and the dimension of the null space of A, therefore, is equal to 1. 
summarizing the whole thing, then we get the following picture. The domain for a three by three matrix is the row space of A. It's a plane inside of R3. It has dimension two. We have two basis vectors to give us a coordinate system for that plane. The null space of A is also in R3. It's a line in R3. The dimension is three minus two is one, a line, and the basis vector along that line. The column space picture is similar. The column space for a rank two matrix has two vectors in it. They define a plane. We have the basis vectors for that plane. And the null space of a transpose, what's left is three minus two is one. So there's a single vector here. It's a line inside of R3. And yes, we could get the basis vector of R3 out of E if you wanted to. Here's the table summarizing the dimensions again. And the only comment left to make for this particular example is that since both domain and codomain are in R3, I could draw everything on a single set of axes, but those planes are quite distinct from each other. If you try and draw it for real, you will see that you're better off separating out the two pictures. For my last example, I just want to discuss the dimensions a little bit more. So I want to look at the matrix of size four by nine. Well, what's the rank? My matrix has size four by nine, so I can get at most four pivots out of it, one in every row. So the rank of that matrix is the minimum of the number of rows and columns is four. So we can have at most four pivots. That means that the dimension of the column space is equal to the rank. The dimension of the row space is equal to the rank. And therefore the dimension of these spaces must be less than or equal to four, depending on what the rank actually is on, how many pivots you actually find. Now the dimension of the null space of A is the number of columns, nine minus the rank. And since the rank is any number between zero and four, that gives me the dimension of the null space of A between five and nine, inclusive. And similarly, the same argument for the null space of A transpose gives me the dimension of the null space of A transpose between zero and four. So what's the takeaway then? The takeaway is actually a nice, simple summary of things. Any vector V in a finite dimensional vector space, so a vector space that needs a finite number of vectors, can be uniquely written as a linear combination of basis vectors. So the moment I have basis vectors, I can write any vector in one and only one linear combination of those basis vectors. And if we fix that basis, then I can set up a definition that goes from the vector to the coordinate vector to simply seeing what the coefficients are that I need. And that is a vector in whatever the dimension of that coordinate system is. Finally, summarizing the fundamental theorem of linear algebra part one is this picture where we have the domain Rn and the codomain Rm of a matrix of size n by n of that linear transformation the row space and null space live in the domain. The column space and the null space of a transpose live in the codomain. The dimensions of the row space and column space of a are the number of pivots called the rank. And the dimensions of the null spaces are whatever number is left over when I take n minus the rank of a, n minus r vectors, m minus the rank of a, m minus r vectors where I pick from is for the row space and the null space. For the row space, I pick from the row echelon form matrix, not from A, from the row echelon form matrix. And I have the number of pivots, vectors in that form. For the null space of A, I have to pick the vectors from the homogeneous solutions. For the column space of A, I'll pick the pivot columns from A, not from the row echelon form, but from A this time around, the rank of A, you would get a basis for a transpose from that matrix E that we multiplied into A to get the row echelon form. And finally, here I've left it for an arbitrary system of numbers that I called F. This theorem applies to arbitrary system of numbers.